Today, I'm gonna to be showing you guys how I go through the process of mixing indie pop songs. Mainly, I wanna hit the points of things that I think are unique to indie pop and approaches you should take when you are mixing it for a release. So why don't we just jump straight into it? Also, just a quick shout out and thank you to Jack for letting me use his song for this video. This is a song we did together called Millennial Waste of Air, and you should go check it out right now because it's really fun. I'll just play the second chorus and show you guys what it sounds like. No. Yeah, we can just start going through some stuff. I did produce this track, so I was able to have a lot of control over the way that the arrangement flowed. And I think one of the main reasons why you can get indie pop to sound so full and massive is just because of the massive amount of like guitar and synth layers happening. So if I just solo the synths and the electric guitars in the chorus. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff happening. And I feel like with indie pop, you're not necessarily trying to have every single layer be completely audible. With mixing, you're normally trying to get everything super separated and stuff like that. But I feel like with indie pop, you're trying to almost get like this big log of like mid range to just kind of sit nicely in the track. So really quickly, I'll just show you we have. So really quickly, I'll show you we have our Juno. You have another pad here. That was one that Jack made from his original demo. We have a couple of these lead guys. Underneath that, we have our electric guitars. Just sort of a strummed, rolled out tone. For this tone, I was using the Plugin Alliance Heat Thorn signature amp from Sir, which I love. A bit of a drivier tone. Basically just doubling the bass line and making it thicker. And then a lead and I think like a pad thing. So you can see we have these layers from a production standpoint that are reaching really high up like these guys. And then we have ones that are very low on the guitar, almost in the range of like a, a higher octave bass arranged in a very simple way so that they can complement each other. You can also see that like for every element we have that is sort of like this striking like dot, 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 dot. We have other elements that are sort of holding out chords. And then we have these guys which are doing more of like a rhythm that's in a higher range but not exactly either of those. They're sort of in between them. So I feel like with that wall of mid-range that people try to get with indie pop, you kind of need to start with arrangement because you can't just take a single Juno pad like this guy and make it as thick as all of these layers put together. Like you kind of need to break it up into multiple instruments. And if there's a problem that I'm constantly seeing in people's indie pop tracks that they are sending to me is that they just don't have anywhere near as many layers as they need. Like I know people say like less is more, but this is one of those instances where more is more. You just need to know where to put the more. Another thing that can help is with band passing. So I'm almost always band passing my pads. So right here, this guy is actually being band passed right now to about 300. So if I take this guy off. Like the voicing and the chords are fine, but it's really big. You can see. It's like got a bunch of low end buildup. It's got some frequencies here that I'm trying to save for the bass. It reaches super high. And this sound in and of itself is a good sound and could probably be like the center point of a track. But for the context that we have in this track where there's a ton of layers being added on top of it, I kind of had to be like, okay, what's like the meat of it that we want to preserve? which was sort of that like nasally mid range. And so I just kind of kept it there. In terms of like actual mixing for these elements, I tend to be very minimalistic. I'm normally high passing stuff a little bit, low passing a lot of the mixing on the individual channels, which I had a lot of guitar amps, so they're all frozen. But as you can see, we have like the Pete Thorne amp and then basically just a limiter, just taming the tiniest bit of the top to keep like specific notes from poking out above the rest. And that's essentially it. I didn't really feel like these guys needed a whole lot. And then to sort 
sort of shift them in the range that I wanted them to. I'm using this harmonics knob and then just going through these different ranges and seeing what sort of makes it pop out the most. I probably did something like this where I soloed them out. Just started shifting through all of them. That one sounded the most pleasant and just pulled it back. Balanced out the output so that it's the same volume when I turn it on and off. This is probably one of my favorite ways to sort of get things to like pop out from a high end standpoint when they're already busy. So the number one thing that you need to look out for when you're like blending those two together is frequency masking. And that's where you have one track that's really excessive in one frequency range and you have another element that's also built up in that same range and they kind of mask each other out. So normally if I had to break down my EQing process, it would be sort of do broadband strokes to get things generally in the right shape that I want. Maybe we do some high passing or low passing, some shelf stuff, very, very light stuff, and then maybe do some additive EQ or harmonic stuff with twin tube to boost out a frequency in one, and then in another track, boost a little bit below that. So you have these two different ranges where they're poking out. This is like a 6 dB boost. It's normally not this aggressive, but just for a visual purpose, that's normally how I'm approaching stuff. Recently, a way that I've tried to just minimize overlap is with track spacer so as you can see i've got this range selected here zeroed in looks like about 130 to about 700 or 800 pretty aggressive ratio and it's side chained to the vocal group so whenever the keys and the guitars are playing together if i turn that off being funny don't know me in rubens saying that you're different turning it on make you cool maybe you should give it it just feels like it's the vocals are able to sort of like come out of like the curtains a little bit more like it, it feels like they're being almost obscured or they're fighting with the keys. Another way that you can do that if you have like Pro Q3 is go to Pro Q3, go to the sidechain input, select whatever you are in competition with masking, and then we're going to turn on sidechain. So this red graph in the back is our vocals and this one up front that we normally see see is our keys and you can see there are these red ranges going up and down so what i would probably do is go through these guys pull them down a little bit we don't really want to get rid of them too aggressively we could also just make them dynamic so that they can like almost similar to track space or just kind of like get out of each other's way i do feel like the lower bands probably need a little bit more help so yeah it helps it sort of get out of the way of the vocals and i think another thing that's important with indie pop is knowing that like vocals are almost always the most important thing we have this sort of well of mid-range that's sort of popping out but we need the vocals to still come out on top because that is the pop in indie pop and that sort of frequency shifting technique i'm also using on the bass and the kick so with this bass shift knob you can see it's sort of tilting the sub low end bass and the higher end of the bass in a certain direction and so on my bass bus i have it tilted a bit this way and then on my kick drum which is the thing that i'm trying to get it to work with i'm tilting it a bit the other way so they naturally sort of like bend out of each other's way a little bit. If you go aggressive, it sounds not good, but you can do stuff that way and still have it turn out pretty good. Another thing that I think is important is uh, your dynamic processing. So I'm almost always using sidechain compression on my percussion bus or my special effects bus. So if there's anything like crashes or rises, like you can see here, our kick, pulling it down snare pulling it down i started doing that when i was doing like hip-hop stuff because a lot of trap beats do that they'll sort of duck like hi-hats or percussion out of the way of the kicks and, and funny enough when i started doing indie pop uh, i found it was the exact same thing it just kind of sounds a little bit better also we should talk about the bass so you already saw the eq stuff that was happening and just as a refresher this is what the bass sounds like With 
with indie pop and synth basses like this, we're almost trying to go somewhere in between that. Like we're definitely adding more low end than a traditional 80s song, but we're also not going as crazy as a trap song. For this specific track, I just separated the bass into like three different ranges. So we have a high range here, getting a little bit of the gravel. Then we have our mid range. And then we have a sort of live bass. And then you just kind of blend them all together and they just they sound like one bass. I mean, it's kind of doing the same thing that we're doing with the mid range on those guitars. We have these different sounds that are accentuating different frequency ranges and we're sort of blending them together. To Let's just listen to the high one. We can see it's filling out a lot of like that higher mid range. And then if we listen to the one that's a bit below that. It's kind of scooped in that range a little bit, but it's reaching down a lot farther. And then if we go to the live bass, it's not reaching down as far, but it's also not quite as heavy in this range. So when we combine all of them together, we end up getting this sound that's sort of full across the whole spectrum. And from a listener standpoint, you can't really tell that it's like multiple instruments. I think another thing that can really help you sculpt your bass tone uh, is some kind of like low end enhancement plugin on your bass. So for this track, I used a Bark of Dog by BOZ Digital Labs, which is free, by the way, and I actually highly recommend checking it out. So here's with, without, with. So yeah, it makes a huge difference. For mixing vocals, again, we're sort of trying to thread the needle between modern and vintage. So here I will just turn off all of our sends and give you the dry vocal to start out with. So we start out with a little bit of C4 just to level it out dynamically. Just because I like leveling things out from a frequency standpoint before I go into my chain, especially if you have something like this where there's a lot of like dynamics in the vocal and he's like popping out with sort of beltier notes. I feel like this can help tame that a little bit more. We go into a de-esser. Just a little bit on the front. Around the time that I was doing this song, I was doing two de-essers right in a row. I'm not really doing this anymore. I think this one is doing more of like a higher range shelf, which can still be cool. It's just uh, normally I like doing one de before and then some more specific frequency dynamic stuff after the fact. But uh, yeah, it still sounds fine. And then a lot of weight is being done by a virtual mix rack here. Oh, your friends don't talk to you because they think you wasted all you had as a youth. Adding color with virtual channel strip. I tend to use the SSL EQ for subtraction and then the Neve EQ for like additive EQ stuff. I think the Distressor is one of the cool compressors ever because it has like a fun little harmonic saturation that just kind of makes a vocal pop out a little bit more and then we're going into some optical compression Boy, your friends don't talk to you. now after i did all that it seemed a little bit too muddy like everything got brought up a little bit too much so i did a little bit more c4 after that Boy, your friends don't talk to you and then a little bit more with uh, some mo tt your friends don't talk to you some d honk with soothe Boy, your friends don't talk to you with a little bit of tiny shaping that i did at a later stage in mixing Boy, your friends don't talk to you and for the most part when i'm doing stuff like a background vocals i'm basically taking that entire strip in the exact same way but i'm shaping things at the end of them a little bit differently like i will normally cut out a little bit more low end and sort of use this presence shift a little bit just because i normally like my vocals that are backgrounds to be almost like hugging my main vocal i don't like them being more bright than the main vocal that's just like a personal preference so i normally just bring this present shift down and maybe on the other vocal like the main vocal i'll turn it the other way but the chain is essentially the same maybe i'll swap out a compressor or change some frequencies earlier on in the chain but yeah i started producing music on um not the strongest computers so i got into a habit of just taking multiple vocals throwing them in a bus and then using a stereo vocal chain on that bus and just sort of leveling them out that way and even though i have a computer now that is strong enough to run multiple vocal chains uh, i still find myself doing that a ton so like these guys here no, I don't buy a 
make it to your show so i'll just say i'm coming that i'll never go they're actually going through the exact same chain they're just panned left and right and then i grouped them and then the chain is on that group which there might be some issues with that i've never encountered any but yeah uh some other things that i think really help are separating your send effects into instruments and non instruments or i guess vocals so we have our vocal chamber here which is just valhalla vintage verb no Same with our uh, our delay here. Like you can kind of let the vocals go through unadulterated. And the reason I like separating out the instrument reverbs into their own different senses, because I like to process those dynamically against the main vocal. So here we have our main instrument reverb going. And we actually have it side chained to the main vocal. So this sort of mud range here that can sometimes be a little bit of a buildup, especially with a mid range heavy genre like indie pop. Whenever the vocal is singing, it's actually pulling out those frequencies. So here, if I turn off those guys. And so we have this sort of like shaped reverb sound that's dynamically pulling in and out around the instruments that we're sending to it. We have the same thing down here on our ambient reverb, which is just like a ROM. And then here's in the track. It just makes things sound a lot cleaner. Like literally if I just turn track spacer off on all these guys. There's a lot more excitement going on, but to me, it's the kind of excitement where when there's too much of it, it, it kind of gets harder to hear things. So with all of them back on. Like we're still getting the excitement from the reverbs, but we're not like completely decimating ourselves with them. I also think another really practical tip for indie pop specifically is on your master chain using something like RC20 or just like a sketch cassette style plugin to just sort of bring in a little bit of color because I feel like a lot of the stuff that is sort of top down mixing esque trying to get stuff to sound vintagey. It's a lot easier if you just start by throwing this on your master out. I wouldn't recommend producing it out that way. Uh, it can be kind of hard to track with a plugin like this on your master if you don't have a powerful computer. But yeah, I do it all the time. And so I don't run into issues with that anymore. And just a little bit of glue compression and limiting. Um, I'm always using the stock Ableton limiter and the stock Ableton glue compressor whenever I'm doing like a temp master before we go to actual mastering just because I feel like it's really hard for people to get a sense of the vibe of the song when it's not like at the volume that they expect it to be or like it doesn't have that like pumpy sound that a limiter can add sometimes like even me as an engineer somebody who masters stuff all the time it is hard for me to get attached to a song and get in the headspace of like okay when the limiter crushes this it'll sound better like it's really hard to for me to do that and so for people who don't even know what a limiter does it's really difficult so I always try to make sure I'm like limiting stuff before I send it to people to like listen to. And in terms of getting my mixes to sound good, the plugins that I am always using are these three guys. Uh, we have Slate VSX, which I have their headphones that go with this plugin, AB Metric from ADPTR Audio Systems, and then uh, an analyzer like Waves has analyzer. This stuff has definitely made mixing stuff a lot more fun and a lot easier in this kind of setup. So the cool thing about AB Metric is you can have your own mix going you can get a lot of info about like your dynamics your integrated loudness your frequencies and stuff like that but where it gets really powerful is you can take reference mixes if you have high quality reference mixes you can just kind of drag them into the plugin but you can literally just reference your mix versus these reference mixes you can narrow in on the mid range or the low mids you can compare your integrated loudness against their integrated loudness even look at things like their stereo field versus your stereo field it just it makes the process 
process of like referencing stuff really fast, really easy. Uh, the next one that I think is really helpful for me, uh, I slept on this plugin for a long time, but this is the uh, Paz Analyzer from Waves. And it's very much like, you don't need this exact analyzer, but I already had it. And a lot of people already have this because they buy like the uh, the platinum bundle from Waves. You just seeing the general shape of your mix uh generally for those of you who don't know you for like a modern clean production mix you want things to be kind of flat here like from a frequency standpoint we kind of want things to be generally hovering flatly here and the vocals coming in definitely changes stuff so you can see like you can see the mid-range almost filled out a bit more when the vocals came in. Also, a thing to note is that indie pop tends to be not as bright as regular mixes, so it is normal to see a bit of a drop-off here. But I think that this is really helpful for just referencing stuff and being like, okay, is my bass too loud? Is my bass not loud enough? Is there enough mid-range? And then for listening environment stuff, I love using the VSX stuff. So just as a reference, this is what it normally does to the mix. And that can sound really yikes, but the whole point of it is it's made to match these specific headphones. So what I normally end up doing is producing and mixing stuff in the final stages with these guys on. And I really like this um, M50 profile. I'll swap over to the boom box. I feel like this profile is really good for almost being like an NS10s setup where you're like seeing if mid range elements are poking out a little bit too much. Like it just makes everything a little bit too harsh. Mike Dean's car. Like it's a really bombastic version of the sound, scooped mids and everything. We have a club. I normally use the bass uh, preset to check my low end. And then the one studio I use is Archon. This will normally be like my last uh, profile that I go through, like on near field. And the fun thing about using this plugin in combination with AB metric is I can actually swap between my reference mixes. And if I'm volume matched, I can have all of my reference mixes also going through this room simulation. And so I can be like, how does the low mid range of all of these 1975 songs compared to the low end of my song in all of these different contexts? And it just, it makes the process of like A being mixed and stuff like that very practical but yeah those are the major points that i would recommend looking at if you're gonna start mixing indie pop um again i would check out millennial waste of air by jack foz i'll put it down in the description uh, it was super fun to work on this track and when in doubt when it comes to mixing indie pop stuff just kind of go for it get inspired by the people and the mixers that you love that you look up to and just i don't know have fun with music don't think mixing is something where there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it there does need to be a point where you're like okay creatively this is what i want to happen and you know once you learn the basics you get some mixes under your belt start doing that start being like okay i'm gonna creatively go this direction and then as long as you're comparing it with a reference mix and making sure you're not going too far out of the realms i think you'll be in a good place but yeah i think that's everything i'll be seeing you guys next week